Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. The Horrific Afterlife of Anne Boleyn Anne Boleyn is known today as the woman who lost her life at the behest of her husband, King Henry VIII. She was his second wife, but not the only wife to lose her head on Tower Green. After Anne's execution, she was buried inside an arrow chest within the floor of St Peter ad Vincula, the chapel within the grounds of the Tower of London. It was when the chapel was renovated in the Victorian era, and the graves inside were dug up, that the horrible truths of the past were unearthed. Join us today to look at the horrific afterlife of Anne Boleyn, and remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. Anne Boleyn fell from grace, and landed sharply onto the blade of a French sword in a calculated downfall by the notorious Thomas Cromwell. Anne and Henry had married in secret in the January of 1533, and this caused so much of a stir that Henry VIII separated from the Roman Catholic Church, making himself the supreme head of the Church of England. England was plummeted into a dark and turbulent time, as it now faced a religious turmoil that would last over a lifetime. Anne and Henry at first were happy. They engaged in a game of cat and mouse. Before they married, and once they were, Anne had a few pregnancies, but with only one producing a healthy baby. With the multiple miscarriages and Henry's disappointment at not having a son, his eyes started to look elsewhere, and Anne was no longer the wife he wanted to be with. Henry had found love elsewhere, and if he wished to marry Jane Seymour, he needed to first find a reason to end his current marriage. This is where Thomas Cromwell comes into play. There was no love lost between Anne and Thomas, and Thomas made it his mission to destroy the Queen. So ultimately, Anne was investigated for high treason, and then, on the 2nd of May 1536, she was sent to the Tower of London and placed on trial. Anne was convicted of incest, treason and adultery, and then on the 19th of May 1536, she was executed. But before Anne was executed, she was kept within the Tower, the same place she was in just three years previous for her own coronation. On the day of her execution, Anne was brought to Tower Green, where the scaffold was erected, ready and waiting for her and the executioner. Whilst on the scaffold, Anne gracefully addressed the people, with a voice somewhat overcome by weakness, which gathered strength as she went on. She begged them to pray for the king, in whom she had always found great kindness, and the spectators could not refrain from tears. After this, she said her goodbyes to her ladies-in-waiting, and as she did, there was not a dry eye in the large crowd. It was at this point that Anne faced her executioner. The expert swordsman from France then performed his duty, striking off Anne's head with a single stroke to the back of her neck to the shock of those witnesses. Many across England believed Anne would go on to become a queen in heaven, including Thomas Cranmer, a key supporter of Anne. Usually, the remains of those executed inside the tower and on Tower Hill were placed into an arrow chest and then buried inside of the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula. The church itself is a Tudor chapel and is the burial place of many of the Tower of London's most famous prisoners. It is the resting place of Anne and also Catherine Howard, along with Lady Jane Grey, her husband Lord Guildford, George Boleyn and many more. Anne was the second person to be laid to rest in front of the high altar of the chapel during the Tudor period and the reign of Henry VIII. Thirteen men and women of note would follow her and her brother to their graves inside the chancel of the building. Usually in the Tudor era, if an individual died as a result from an execution for treason, then they would have no headstone or celebration for their life. Their resting place would not be marked, and although Anne Boleyn's treatment after her death follows in this pattern, there was in fact a record kept of her burial place. A Tudor chronicler wrote at the time of another Tudor execution, their corpses with their heads were buried in the chapel in the tower at the high altar. There is a floor plan of the interments of the chancel, and it shows Anne laying to the left of the altar. 
and that after Anne was executed, there were many more deaths and burials within this chapel. Then in the era of Queen Victoria, the chapel where Anne is buried became the focus of renovations. It was during her reign that large-scale restorations occurred at the chapel. Victoria, upon visiting the chapel, ordered the improvements not just to the decor, but also to the heating systems. Plans were made to restore the chapel, but during restorations there was a significant amount of desecration of some of the most high-profile graves. Queen Victoria was alarmed to find that the chapel was being used as a meeting room, and as Victoria was dead against this, she ordered the restoration of the building. Large amounts of improvements were made to the small church, as Victoria felt the place was not fit for purpose, nor was it appropriate for the burial of royalty or other high-born individuals who rest there. It was during these renovations that the floor required lifting, and the builders found they needed to exhume the bodies of the souls who lay near the altar and the high chancel. You see, the pavement of the church had sunk and become uneven, and when the flagstones of the chapel were lifted, it was found that those bodies buried within the walls of the chapel during the Tudor period and Stuart period had repeatedly become desecrated. The floor was then relayed, but at this point the area in front of the altar where Anne Boleyn lay, had been left. It was planned to leave the chancel alone, but significant changes were needed, which meant the exhumation of Anne Boleyn needed to go ahead. On the 9th of November 1876, the body of a queen was to be exhumed, whilst those in the outside world went on with their lives oblivious to it all. Anne had been laid to rest for 300 years at this point, and as they began to dig carefully into the ground, at around two foot of depth, they found Anne's remains. The bones had all heaped together in one spot. However, disturbingly, the grave had already been tampered with before. Anne Boleyn's grave had been disturbed by the collapsing and decaying of a coffin of a 54-year-old woman named Hannah Beresford, who was buried in a similar spot in 1750. It was decided that the cause of the pavement collapse was this burial, and that it had also disturbed Anne's burial spot. A surgeon named Dr. Frederick J. Moat, along with his team, carefully and forensically recorded Anne's remains. He then said, A female of between 25 and 30 years of age, of a delicate frame of body, and who had been of slender and perfect proportions. The forehead and lower jaw were small and especially well formed, the vertebrae were particularly small, especially one joint, the atlas, which was next to the skull, and that they had bore witness to the queen's little neck. After this, there were a more thorough examination, which concluded that the bones of the head indicated a well-formed round skull, and that there was an intellectual forehead, straight orbital ridge, large eyes, oval face and rather square full chin. The remains of the vertebrae and the bones of the lower limbs indicated a well-formed woman of middle height, with a short and slender neck. The ribs showed depth and roundness of chest. The hands and feet bones indicated delicate and well-shaped hands and feet, with tapering fingers and a narrow foot. All of the men who helped exhume Anne's body were sure it was a female, and after the remains were exhumed carefully, they were then handed over to the governor of the tower. He stored them inside his house, which was the Queen's house, and two days later, more bodies were found, including that of Jane Rochford and Margaret Pole. Anne's bones showed that she was around five foot or five foot three, and it confirmed death by beheading. Anne's body would be stored within the Queen's house for a further five months before she was laid to rest once more. And then, on Friday the 13th of April, 1877, seven men, at midday, including the resident chaplain of the chapel, gathered inside the chancel. This time it was to lay the bodies to rest, in specially made caskets. Each of these were made from thick lead and were held together, with copper screws in boxes made of oak plank, around one inch in their thickness. An etching was made onto the coffins with their names and the year they died with the date of their reinterment on also. A note was made of their burials, and a decorative floor outlines the location of the graves. There has been a long debate around the body of Anne Boleyn. Was it truly her remains that were located? 
But with that being said, regardless of the truth, Anne has become a subject of pilgrimage with many individuals travelling from around the world to visit her and have a moment of reflection. I was actually lucky enough to visit the Tower of London this past summer and pay my respects to the once Queen of England and the other men and women who were buried within the chapel. Walking into the chapel there is a real sense of reverence. A moment of reflection gives you a great sense of respect for the men and women within the walls, for their bravery and courage in their final moments. But it also gives you a sense of hope for the future, that the events of the past are never repeated. Today Anne Boleyn is seen by so many as a martyr. She was a woman whose life was so cruelly stolen away from her by the evil men who dominated the country at the time. She was condemned to death, and there was no justice for her. But instead Anne left behind perhaps the greatest legacy. Anne was unable to have a son, and this angered Henry VIII. For who would his heir be? But instead, Anne's daughter, Elizabeth, would go on to become one of the greatest queens that ever lived, a true stand against the man who ordered her execution. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.